Good morning, church. This morning, we're going to hear another language, one that I don't suppose I've heard scripture read from before. And Ellie's going to be reading from the, in Arabic this morning. So uh, thank you for reading, Ellie. Assalamu alaikum. Sab Saida. Peace be upon you. Happy Sabbath. The scriptures reading for today is from Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. And I will be reading in Arabic. Walakin in Basharnakum Nahnu al Malikum in Asama. بِغَيْرِ مَا بَشَّرْنَكُمْ فَلَيَكُنْ أَنَاتَمَا كَمَا سَبَقْنَا فَقُلْنَا أَقُولُ الْآنْ أَيْضًا إِنْ كَنَا أَحَدُ يُبَشِّرُكُمْ بِغَيْرِ مَا قَبِلْتُمْ فَلَيَكُنْ أَنَاتَمَا I think we all picked up on the word anathema, right? You kind of, that's the one I could figure what she was saying. Um, you know, I heard a sermon, or actually a, a series of sermons, over 20 years ago. And in those messages, it kind of stirred my holy thinking back then. And um, I think it's time I want to share some of these ideas with you. And you kind of know one of the ways I, I really like to share is from stories from the Bible and kind of applying them for today. And um, as usual, I wish I could devote more time to this subject. Um, there never seems to be enough time or enough Sabbaths to cover all that I want to cover. And, but uh, let's delve right in. In March of 2018 of this year, I got contacts. And you can tell this morning I'm not wearing contacts. Or my eyesight's really bad if I need contacts and eyeglasses. But um, I found them a challenge. They're a major change for me. I, uh, I lost one the very first week, uh, but I love not having to wear glasses. They're so, it's so convenient if I'm riding a bike or doing sports or exercising, not having to wear these things. I'm very rough on glasses. I lose them. I scratch them up. I'm, I have a hard time wearing glasses. But anyway, I met with an ophthalmologist, and she shared with me, she said, you know, if you swap from these bifocals that you're wearing to contacts, there's going to be some compromises that come with that. And I found out she was right. Uh, you know, I had to decide, I have a, I see pretty well from a distance, or very well, close up I have a hard time. And so I had to sacrifice a little bit on the long distance when I wear the contacts, but up close I can see fine and there's so many benefits, they outweigh uh, any negatives, at least for me. As you can see, I'm not wearing them right now because uh, I still have not learned to put them in. On Thursday, I put both in the first time. Yesterday, it took me 20 minutes to get them in. Today, I attempted two different times and had a limited amount of time with the sermon coming up, and I was not able to get them in, so I'm wearing glasses again. But the point in this is this. This was a major change for me. And change is a natural thing. Change is a healthy thing. In fact, we must have change if we expect to grow, right? That, that has to take place. But with change, one of the things we have to be very careful with is that, um, we, that we, we, we have to watch out for that we don't, as we're experiencing change or compromise, that, that we don't um, surrender any of our long-held or biblical standards or beliefs. In matters of religion and theology, we've got to be careful that change doesn't become a disguise for compromise. Um, any, for, for any of us to experience compromise, whether it be personally, individual level, or corporately as a church, um, if we're going to have compromise, there has to be a different way of seeing things that begins to take place, a way of understanding certain truths or something we've understood before, and there has to be a shift if we're going to do that. Because compromise, one way it can be described is uh, meeting, like having two opposing ideas and somehow meeting in the middle. And so you have to, some change has to occur to do that. And it's not always wrong to do that. But in theology and religion, again, we have to be very, very careful. 
And, you know, it takes time for change and compromise usually to occur. And one of the things uh, about standards is they aren't usually just dropped or lowered in just a moment. We don't automatically decide or someone just tells you, hey, this, and you just believe it. Usually change, especially of things like standards, is lowered in, over the course of time. And I think we would all agree that we live in a society that's very different from the one, at least it, those of my age and, and maybe a little younger and certainly older than me, we live in it a different way. And pardon my slang, the world and even the church just ain't what it used to be. And so there was a time when Christians of all denominations um, looked at the Bible as a rule of faith. And the various churches, they all had different interpretations about how you might have approached this or that. But the Bible was pretty much the guidebook for all Christian denominations. And as you probably know, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we were once known as the people of the book. And so we as a church, we held more firmly to a thus saith the Lord than any of the other churches that I'm aware of. And so that's what we held to. If God said it, we believed it, and that settled it, right? Right? There's been a general falling away from the Word, not just in our church, but, uh, you know, corporately across the world in most Christian churches. Uh, but we, as a Seventh-day Adventist church, we felt kind of safe because we were, after all, the people of the book. And so we thought we were okay. But to add another cliche, times are changing. And that's what's taken place. We've come to a place in history where plain, black and white, clear issues that are taught in the Bible, now in the name of political correctness or of open-mindedness, has now become labeled as gray areas. And we don't want to appear like we're different from others, so we have begun to take the word a little less seriously and given it a little less authority in our lives than we used to do so. How can the church come to the place like this? And I've, I've talked about this some before, but I think it's important that we keep coming back to this to understand how this could happen to us. And I believe that the answer to how that could happen in the church lies in what's going on in society as a large, in a whole. Um, the way that society is perceiving things and seeing things and understanding things has slipped into the church through the back door. And the view of life that's prevalent in our culture today among millennials and others, it flies in the face of a biblical worldview. And that's one of the reasons that we're dealing with things in the church that we're never, we've never thought, or a hundred years ago, it would never have been dreamed that you would even be thinking about this in the church. How, you know, why would we even be approaching or trying to reevaluate certain things? Nowadays, there's no one certain way of looking at things. Everything is a matter of perspective and Everyone has their own perspective, so there is no absolute truth. I read a book called Preaching to a Shifting Culture. On page 180, it said this, We can characterize the postmodern or the, the thinking today, the millennials today, the millennial mind as skeptical of uncertainty, excuse me, skeptical of certainty, rejecting of moral absolutes, and on guard against control. And so to some degree or another, the Bible has been rejected as authoritative in the lives in the, of the majority of our society today. And we see it reflected in the church. We look at things like uh, homosexuality and we take, we're, we're ordaining priests and pastors and, and alcohol is no longer evil. And, and there are a host of other things that are spelled out very clearly in the scriptures that, that we, we've now twisted and turned them or some have 180 degrees where we wonder and we've, um, we don't want fe people to feel ostracized. We don't want them to feel unloved or what they're doing is morally wrong. And so we back off on the truth. And I'll just tell you as a pastor... If you want to share truth with someone today, you almost have to apologize for doing it. I can't tell you how I had to think about some of these things, to carefully word some things, and I know they still are not going to come off in a way that's going to be appealing to some people. But you have to think about these things. And, 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 it, and to some degree, you, I should be responsible for the way we say things, right? We always want to be kind. You want to be loving. Uh, but there are certain things that just have to be shared sometimes. And I, again, preachers today, if you want to share some things, you have most have to apologize to do that. Listen to this. Um, this is from uh, 
Culture Shift a book I read also. It's called Two Out of Three Americans Today Surveyed Said They Agreed with the Statement There is No Absolute Truth. Different people can define truth in conflicting ways and still be correct. Now, I can't help what's happening in this world around me and in society. I can't help that whatsoever. But my goal is to take a stand for the scriptures and the authority of the word of God in the church and in particular in this local congregation where I'm held responsible by God for it. So today and next week, we're going to look at a couple of Old Testament stories and you say, oh, you're not going to be preaching about Jesus. If you preach from the Bible and you pre you're preaching about Jesus, right? It's his word. He, he, you know, it's from Jesus. All of it's from Jesus, right? And so anyway, um, I'm going to do two stories. And when I say two stories, I don't mean something that Uncle Dan or Aunt Sue told about. I mean, these are literal historical events that took place, and we want to look at them. And I want to see uh, how they might apply to us today. And that's one of the things that, that I think is important about our Bible studies, about preaching, that we see how those things from here, from this book, can affect us today. And so that's what we want to try and do. I want us to see the importance and authority of God's word in our lives, and we'll see some other things as we go. But first, if you would, of course, let's pray. Father, it's um, a privilege to be in the presence of the living God. This is a place that you have ordained that we come together at this time and that we come before our maker and that we offer our praises, our thanks, our offerings, the sacrifice of thanksgiving. And so we are grateful today. I'm grateful, Lord, that we serve a God that loves us, that sent his son for us, and that wants to redeem us and wants to spend eternity with us. And so today as we open your word, I'm praying that the power of that God, you will speak to us through your word in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would open your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 12. 1 Kings chapter 12, we're going to begin in verse 25. You'll notice I don't have a PowerPoint today. Um, time constraints limited me on that. We'll see what happens next week. But 1 Corinthians chapter King, uh, excuse, 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 25. And while you're turning there, let me give you a little background on what's going on. David, you know, um, David is dead now. Then his son Solomon became the king. And Solomon is dead now, and then he had some sons, you know, Rehoboam, and he had Jeroboam, and Rehoboam became the king. And as you know the story, Rehoboam went and listened to the young guys and, uh, who was in his, on his church board, and they gave him some bad advice, and Israel rejected him as king. And so there became this division. There was a north was Israel, Jeroboam was the king, there was a southern portion was Judah, Rehoboam was the king. The capital of the north is Samaria, and the capital of the southern kingdom was Jerusalem. And so the son of Rehoboam is the king of Judah, and, and Jeroboam is the king of Israel. And a God had established that the worshipers come and worship him in Jerusalem. This was the place of worship. This was the ordained place. They couldn't say, you go where you want to go. He said, go to Jerusalem. This is the holy place I want to worship you at, and you want, I want you to worship me at. And so, anyway, I want to begin in verse 25. It says, Then Jeroboam built Shechem in the mountains of Ephraim and dwelt there. Also he went out from there and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom may return to the house of David if these people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem. Then the heart of this people will turn back to their Lord, Rehoboam king of Judah, and they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam king of Judah. So, Let's look at it from a modern standpoint. Jeroboam is afraid that the people are going to, as God had told them, they're going to go and they're going to worship in Judah and Jerusalem like he had instructed them. And when they go there, they're going to kind of like the worship service. They're going to like being there and they're going to conspire against him and they're going to reject him. And so Jeroboam, he calls together a church board meeting and he gets and he says, let's, he wants to figure out how to handle this situation now that's suddenly come to be. And so they come up with a plan and the leaders and the, and the church board members begin to say, well, let's do what the mega churches are doing. Those Amalekites and the Amorites, they have these new ways of worshiping. Let's go and see what Bill Hybels and, and uh, you know, some of these guys like Rick Warren and, some, and, and Andy Stanley, let's see what they're doing and let's do that in our church. 
It'll attract those people to stay with us rather than going down to where God has told them to worship. Jeroboam hears what the, the, the board members are telling him, and he said, that sounds good. Let's try it. His head elder says, let's do like the mega corporations, like, no offense, David. Uh, he says, let's do what the mega church corporations do. Let's, like McDonald's and, and Burger King and Kentucky Fried Chicken. You know, I had to throw something about Kentucky in, right? So he says, let's do what they do. And, and Jeroboam, he says, well, well, what are they doing? He says, well, they give the customer what they want. They let the people have it their way. If you want your church to grow, you've got to do what these people are doing. You've got to give the members what they want. If they want to drink a little alcohol, that's okay as long as they love Jesus. They can drink a little alcohol on the side. He said, if they want to wear some jewelry, that's fine as long as they love Jesus. Uh, they, they can live together without getting married, that's okay. The important thing is that they love Jesus, and if they love Jesus, we can give the customer what they want. You hear what I'm saying, right? The pendulum is swung in churches at one point, I was told, I've never experienced it since I've been a Seventh-day Adventist Christian since 1992. I was told that our church was very legalistic. I don't see that. I've, I have not experienced that since I've been a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. In fact, it's, it's quite the opposite to some degrees. What I'm afraid of today is that the churches uh, are becoming a place to meet our needs rather than to meet Jesus. To, to meet what we want, what we like rather than going at, from the attitude and the perspective of, of what does God want, what does God expect. And so we've changed it to a, 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 a me-centered focus. Culture Shift, page 29 and 30 says, It's also a great temptation to make Christianity attractive to seekers by misrepresenting the faith as a relationship through Christ with a God who is the divine vending machine in the sky there to meet our every need. Unhappy? Unattractive? unsuccessful, unmarried, unfulfilled, come to Christ, He'll give you everything you ask for. Does God meet our needs? Yes, of course He does. But we forget that God is not primarily in the business of meeting my needs or meeting your needs. And you know, when we make Him out to be that way, we squeeze Him out of the rightful place that He has, has established as the, the center of our lives. And God is, is, is not in the business of meeting our needs. God is in the business of being God. And Christianity cannot be reduced to God meeting people's needs because when we attempt to make it so, what we do is we invariably distort the image of what Christianity really is. God's agenda is to display His glory and to further His kingdom around the globe. He, is to save, he wants to save every person on this globe. It's to call humanity to a bended knee and a bowed head before Him in adoration and devotion and dependence and service. And so merely using need as our main basis of making sense of Christianity knocks us away from the way believers have understood the faith since the beginning of Christian faith. Because God no longer occupies the center stage and we have put us and our needs at the center stage. And when that happens, we may be preaching, we may be sharing faith, but what we're communicating is not genuine Christianity. In Christianity, the one place that self cannot be is at the center. God and God alone can be at the center. That is it. That's the bottom line. You know, a lot of times people today look for churches that teach what they believe rather than for looking for churches that teach what the Bible says in spite of what they may believe. Anyway, let's go back to our story. You know, we're having the board meeting. So during the board meeting, one of the youth leaders speaks up. Says, hey, King, we need to keep our young people in the church. We, and what we need to do is give them a worship experience that's going to meet their needs. And the king says, well, how do we do that? He said, well, let's take an opinion poll. Let's send out a poll among the... You can send out an email to the members, and let's get a poll and see what they have to say. If they want a band, let's bring in a band. If they want to throw out the Sabbath and, 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 and doing things on the Sabbath and observing the Sabbath, let's throw it out. If they want to bring in puppets and clowns and dance during worship, let's do it. Let's do whatever we need to keep the youth is what the youth leader says. So King Jeroboam, he thinks about all the things he's heard in the board meeting. He brings, the, brings all this stuff together in his mind. And he says, you know, well, what if we introduce this brand new form of worship? And Israel says, 
You know, those who want to follow the Bible, the, the God's Word, he says, they're not going to like it. So how are we going to justify all this? And he says this. He says, well, some of the board members says, let's send some people down to the, to the seminary, down to Jerusalem, down to, to Berrien Springs, and let's ask for some suggestions how we can make this all become kosher to the people, how we can, we can make this uh, brand new worship sound good to the people. And so they go down and they talk to the professors down at the seminary and, and they search the archives and they come up with something. They said, you know, King, back during the days of the pioneers, we saw something take place very similar to what's happening right now. During the time of, of, of Moses and Aaron, it happened on Mount Sinai. There was this special worship service that they had. And the pastor in charge then was Pastor Aaron. In fact, his church was a mega church. He had over a half a million men in his church. He had a celebration style worship. And, you know, the Bible says they played and danced before the Lord. I want you to go with me in Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32. Beginning in verse 1. Exodus chapter 32, beginning in verse 1. Exodus 32, beginning in verse 1, says, Now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. And Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off all the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and molded a calf. And then they said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And so when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Then they rose up the next, early on the next day, offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. So here... Aaron, who's the head elder of the church, he sets up a new form of worship. He makes this golden calf. He says, this is your God. He makes this false God. Then he makes a new day of worship. He says, tomorrow we're going to be worshiping. Not on the day God's appointed. We're going to start worshiping tomorrow. Look in verse now uh, uh, of 15 through 18. I thought this was interesting. And Moses turned and went down from the mountain. And the two tablets of the testimony were in his hand. The tablets were written on both sides. On the one side and on the other side, they were written. Now the tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. <clears throat> and when Joshua, listen to this, when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. But Moses says, but he, speaking of Moses, says, it's not the noise of the shout of victory nor the noise of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing that I hear. So when Mo notice this. When Moses and Joshua were coming down from Mount Sinai from meeting with God, or Moses had, Mo uh, Joshua had been waiting for him there. And when he comes down, Joshua hears this noise, this young man who's, who, who, who hadn't spent the time in, in Egypt like Moses had. And he hears this noise, and he, it, the, the, the sound of it sounds like war to him. But Moses says, no, I know what that is. That's that Egyptian worship style. They got the music that sounds like a war beat. He said, that's not, that's not a fight. That's music. He said, they're having, they're, they're having worship down there. Moses recognized this was something from, from, from Egypt. Now, I'd... I don't have time to get into discussion of, of music today because, frankly, I have not come to all the, uh, my conclusions. Years ago, I bought a, 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 this many, a, a book. I don't know how many books I have on worship in my office in there. I, one of these days, I'm going to do a conclusive study, come to my conclusions. I never have done that. But, but the point was, this music that, was, that, that they were playing, Moses, it sounded like a war beat to Joshua. But not to Moses. He knew it was, it was Egyptian worship music. And you can see that Jeroboam is doing the same thing that Aaron is doing. Both of them were justifying in their minds that this is what's, this is what's best for the people. This is what they're used to. Go to 1 Kings chapter 12. Back to 1 Kings 12. And while you're going there, this board meeting ends. Jeroboam begins to initiate this worship that he's talking about at once. In verse 28, 1 Kings um, 
12, verse 28. Therefore the king asked advice, made two calves of gold, and said to the people, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, which brought you up from the land of Egypt. It's too much for you, he said. It's too much trouble. Um, the king wanted to give them a religion with a discount. He, wanted to, he, he didn't want to be too, too much for them. He didn't want to cost them anything. He wanted a religion that says, hey, if you don't like what the Bible says, if you don't like what God has established, you know, we can kind of lower the standards. We can start to do it our net way from now on. If it's not convenient to get up in time for Sabbath school, and I know it was tough this morning. If you're used to coming at 1030, I walked around and every class was like a, a ghost. You know, there was nobody was there. There was not even teachers in some classes. And I understand. We're shifting back to different service. But, but you know, if, it, if it's too much for you to get up for Sabbath school, don't worry about it. If it's too much to go to midweek service, it's all right. Don't worry. A book called The Day America Cold the Truth said this, I don't see the, 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 in this survey that they did, said, I don't see the point in observing the Sabbath. 77% of the people that were uh, surveyed said that. 77%. 74%, I will steal from those who don't really miss it. 64% um, said, I will lie when it suits me so long as it doesn't cause any real damage. 56% said, I will drink and drive if I feel I can handle it. 53% said, I will cheat on my spouse. 50% said, I will procrastinate at work and do absolutely nothing about one full day out of five. 41% said, I will use recreational drugs. 30% said, I will cheat on my taxes. Now, I know those things, they have, they're not in here, but some Christians and some believers want a discount on some of the beliefs and the practices that are spelled out very clearly in the Scriptures. And this is what Jeroboam wanted. A book called Apologetic Preaching said this, During the modern era, people attended the church of their particular denominational heritage. Postmoderns, or even millennials we might say, shop for a church that offers choices. To them, one religious choice is about as good as another. If it doesn't matter what you believe, or excuse me, it doesn't matter what you believe, as long as you believe something is the mantra. And you know, as long as we are sincere, that's all that matters to God. And believe me, brothers and sisters, you may have heard that, but I've heard that. If I've heard it once, I've heard it a hundred times over the years as a pastor. As long as I'm sincere, that's all that matters to God. Don't you dare believe that. So King Jeroboam, he tells Israel, he says, Hey, look, it's too much for you to go all the way to Jerusalem to worship. You know, hay prices are going up, so we're going we're gonna to offer you a brand new form of religion. You can do it here. We'll give you a couple of places you can go. It's not really important how or where we worship. Just be sincere. Just love Jesus and none of that other stuff. It doesn't matter whatsoever. Verse 29, look. And he set up one in Bethel. Speaking of those calves. <clears throat> he set up one in Bethel and the other he put in Dan. So these were strategic locations. Bethel means a house of God. And Bethel was a place, it was the southernmost point of, of the nation of Israel. And Dan was way down on, on, the, up on the northern point. And so one golden calf was here, one golden calf was there. We'll have two worship services. You can choose what you want to do. And this is no reflection on a first and second service at all. So don't, don't, don't misinterpret this. <clears throat> I am glad we have one service though. It's interesting because Bethel was the site where the patriarchs and the prophets, they all did their worship. This is where they used to worship God. Now, this would have been the traditional service. This is the service where the, the, the conservatives go, so to speak. The older people, you might call them. <laughs> Dan was the site uh, where this renegade priest, you look in Judges chapter 18, he went into rebellion. He established his own form of worship down there. This is where Dan... And so this would have been the contemporary service, if you will. Uh, this is the service for those millennials, the postmoderns, the, 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 the liberals, if you would. I mean no offense by those terms. I'm just throwing them out there. But, but King Jeroboam has given them two choices. If you want the traditional service, go to Bethel. If you want a more contemporary service, go down to Dan. So these new innovations that he brings in, look in verse 30. It didn't end there. Now this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one as far as Dan. The Bible says it became a sin for the people. That's what happens when we start to lower God's standards and we start to change His Word for any reason that we choose to do so. That's what begins to happen. 
Now, I'm going to diverge. I want to share a few quotes with you now. And, <clears throat> and here's, here's where the preacher feels like he needs to, to, to uh, back up and apologize before he shares. These are just quotes I'm going to share with you. I want to be kind because when I, I think about worship and reverence and those sort of things, you know, you, as a pastor, you really feel guilty because you think about the things you do and you think, oh, all, everybody sees you do that. And so you feel bad about those things. But this is for all of us. This is not just for you. This is for all of us. Look in the bulletin. I have one there. It says, It's too true that reverence for the house of God has become almost extinct. Sacred things and places are not discerned. The holy and the exalted are not appreciated. Is there not a cause for the want of fervent piety in our families? Is it not because the high standard of religion is left to trail in the dust? God gave rules of order, perfect and exact, to his ancient people. Has his character changed? Is he not the great and mighty God who rules in the heaven of heavens? We have abundant reason even to be more thoughtful and reverential in our worship than had the Jews. But an enemy has been at work to destroy our faith in the sacredness of Christian worship. I am the worst. As Paul said, I, you know, I'm the, I'm the worst of all sinners. I feel this compulsion, be it my personality, be whatever it is, that I want to greet everybody in here. And so sometimes you can see me wandering around trying to do it because if I think I'm not going to see you after the service or whatever, I want to try and sneak over and say hi to you and shake your hand. And I don't know if that's right or wrong. But I wonder if it isn't distracting to some of you when I'm doing that sometimes. And so I think we, this idea of reverence in the sanctuary, as you said, it's, it's, been, it's been to some degree, it's been, it's been thrown out. It's, it's extinct. And there were so many quotes I wanted to get in today. And I, I missed Sabbath school adding some in here, and, and, and I had to pick and choose what all I was going to leave out. And so I left a host of, of really good stuff out this morning. But you know, this is God's house. When we come in those doors, when we, you hear me say we, that means me too. When we come in those doors, there should be something different that takes place. Something different should take place. Um, another quote. This is Child Guidance, page 542, the next page from the previous quote. There should be a sacred spot like the sanctuary of old where God is to meet with his people. That place should not be used as a lunchroom or as a business room. So pardon me for having a business meeting here. We won't be doing that anymore. Uh, or as a business room, but simply for the worship of God. There should be a solemn awe upon the worshipers as they enter the sanctuary, and they should leave behind all common worldly thoughts, for it is the place where God reveals His presence. It is the, as the audience chamber of the great and eternal God. When we come in those doors, it should be with reverence and awe. We hardly have any reverence for anything anymore, right? That's the way our culture is. And so we can't help it to some degree because we are submersed in it 24-7, other than the hours and the time that we spend here. We are in culture in one way or another. And so it inevitably we're, uh, wears out, wears off on us to some degree says there should be a solemn awe as we enter the sanctuary. Leave behind all common worldly thoughts. Common talk. Common talk. Um, I want to be gentle about how I handle this as well. But, you know, I'm on the worship committee, and we have had, and I've had calls, I have people coming to me saying, you know, how the mother's room can be a place for just a free-for-all sometimes. But it's a place where mothers, our fathers, are to take their kids and to train them up to be reverential in the sanctuary. That's what the, in my understanding, that's what the mother's room is. It's a place to train little ones who are not able to contain themselves yes, to, yet to, 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 be, to transition them at some point into the sanctuary. Is that right? So again, I'm not trying to be hard. I, we, we all we, we get into different habits and things and we don't think much about it and it's just kind of what we do. But anyway, I want to throw one in for the preachers now. You know I had to do that one as well. This is from Child Guidance, page 545. It says, Nothing that is sacred, nothing that pertains to the worship of God, should be treated with carelessness and indifference. When the word of life is spoken, you should remember that you are listening to the voice of God through his delegated servant. Do not lose these words through inattention. If heeded, they may keep your feet from straying into wrong paths. 
That's one for the preachers I had to put there, right? All right, let's go back to the story. Look at verse 31. <clears throat> Did that hurt too much? That didn't hurt too bad, right? Was, it, was I kind? I hope I was. Uh, verse 31. <clears throat> He made shrines on the high places. He made priests from every class of people who were not the sons of Levi. There's a sermon in that one. Another innovation. Jeroboam said, why should the ministry be restricted only to the males of the tribe of Levi? Why should only men be ordained uh, and men who happen to be Levites? It's true that Moses had said so, but that was then. This is now. We're living in a different day and age. We don't have to worry about that anymore. We're living in a new day. Let's don't worry about that, Jeroboam. We can ordain anybody we want to. Everybody has spiritual gifts. As long as you have a degree from the seminary and you love Jesus, we can ordain you. And the danger of that is that there's some truth mixed with error. Pastor Richard O'Fell said this. He said, when you mix error with truth, listen, error becomes more prolific. That's because error loses nothing of its error when it's mixed with truth. On the contrary, when it's mixed with truth, error gains credibility. Right? That's the danger of mixing error and truth. So Jeroboam, he decides to go ahead. Verse 31, he says, He made priests of the lowest people, which were not of the sons of Levi. But that's not all. Look in verse 32. Jeroboam ordained a feast on the 15th day of the 8th month. So Jeroboam, he, he makes a feast on the 15th day of the 8th month. God had said to do it on the 15th day of the 7th month. But Jeroboam said, no, I'm going to do it on the 8th month. So Jeroboam now has his own gods. He's made the calves. He's had his own priests. He's ordaining anybody he wants to. And he's changed the day of worship as well. Notice the slippery slope that happens when we start to compromise the Word of God. As we start to come to the end of this message today, I want to make it clear that this sermon is not about trying to discourage change or, dis, or, 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 or doing things that's going to, that's in harmony with the scriptures and the spirit of prophecy. But we've got to be careful that we don't throw out truth to make room for change. You know, Jesus did things so differently that he was called a heretic, you know? He, he, was, he was called a lot of names. And so, um, one of the major problems today. It's a mindset it, that's seeping in over into the church is that we can make up our own rules, we can make our own decisions as long as we're genuine, as long as we're sincere about what we're doing. Sincerity is no um, indicator of truth or what's right. Notice verse 32 and 33. Jeroboam ordained a feast on the 15th day of the 8th month, like the feast that was in Judah, and offered sacrifices on the altar. So he did at Bethel, sacrificing to the calf that he had made. And at Bethel he installed the priests of the high places which he had made. So he made offerings on the altar which he had made at Bethel on the 15th day of the 8th month, in the month which he had devised in his own heart. And he ordained a feast for the children of Israel. And he, he might add, offered sacrifices on the altar and burned incense." Man-made religion. He made, he installed, he had made, he ordained, he offered. He, he, he. Any religion or worship that's not founded in the scriptures or any portion of worship that's not founded in the scriptures is a man-made worship, right? And brothers and sisters, we need to be known as a people of the book once again, I believe. We need to be people that, that, that others know that church, those people in that church, they stand on what the Bible says. When it's inconvenient, when it's, you know, when it may be harmful to them, their finances, whatever it is, they're it may, may cause them to lose friends. They're going to stand on what the Bible says. The world needs to know that there are people who hold the Bible as their authority of their lives. Political correctness and the desire for approval should fall short of a desire that we want to find the approbation of the living God. You know, worship uh, is a means to an end. Worship, you know, we need to worship God in spirit and truth. And, and maybe we'll get into some of that next week. But, you know, Matthew chapter 15, verse 9, Jesus said, But in vain they do worship me. In vain they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And we, we're so quick to throw that out to other churches. You're worshiping on the wrong day, so that's vain worship, right? 
But I think we might have vain worship with us as, in, in our services if we're not careful. Verse 33. There's where we find this dedication to the service of Jeroboam's worship that he just made. He invited all the dignitaries. He's got the conference president and the officers from the conference there. He's got everybody. He's ready to cut the ribbon, the opening service of this new work religion that's designed for young people and busy people and for those who just happen to be passing by. And everybody's ready for the worship they're about to begin. And then chapter 13 takes place. It says, and behold... Now that's where we're going to pick up next Sabbath. We're going to begin with this and behold. And we're going to look at this story of this old prophet who is a prophet of God. He comes and he makes this proclamation and all these things occur. And then he gets killed by a lion. And we're going to see five reasons why that happened and five reasons how compromise and some of these things can affect us. But it, for today, it boils down to this. Like it or not, we're living in a time where the thinking and the culture around us is, is, is very... Uh, truth has now become subjective, especially for the younger generations. And, and we can disagree with it all, and we can dislike it as much as we, we, we want, but it's still it's where we're living right now, right? That's where we're at, whether we, we want to be there or not. And that way of thinking infiltrates the church sometimes as well. You say, well, so what? The reason, as I understand it, is this, is that ultimately our approach to worship it is our approach to God. And what I mean by that is how we view worship is based on our view of God. The same as I said last week on, about prayer. How we view and understand prayer is based on our understanding of God. And so if we have a low view of worship, we have a low view of God. And so consequently, our deportment in the sanctuary is important. Because I realize when I come in here, I'm not coming to stand before Pastor Carlos. If I'm in the right mindset, if, if I as a pastor am in the right mindset, I am coming before a holy God. Our words in the sanctuary are important. Our dress for worship is important. And I don't mean you have to be wearing a tux or you have to be a uh, tux, excuse me. But I mean, you know, we, if you go to your, your, the, the president of the United States or the boss of your company or whoever, you're going to dress in, in, in accordance to meeting that person's uh, role, Right? So if I'm going to meet God, I want to dress in a way that I would feel comfortable meeting the Creator God. Why is this important? Because it's representative of the view we have of who we are worshiping. That's why. If I love Jesus like He loves me, then out of love and reverence for Him, I will come with a heart open to hearing from Him when I come through those doors. I will come in a manner that is dressed to meet Him. I will speak about things that will draw me and those I speak to towards Him rather than away from Him. I will remember that He is not just my loving Savior, but He's also the Lord of heaven and earth whom I have come to give praises and worship to. And I will focus my attention on him rather than on me and on my needs. That is the way we should come as I understand to worship. So this week, we see how Jeroboam did all these things in his way. And we can see how that um, transfers into today. And, and next week, I want to see God's response to Jeroboam's new worship and we're going to look at this prophet again who died at the hand of the Lord, and we're going to see why. But the, the burden of my heart today is not to discourage any of us. Because I think if we get our heads around, and, and I still haven't done so either, what it really means to come in those doors and why we're here, it's going to transform not just the experience that takes place here during this hour, but it's going to transform our lives. It will transform everything about us when we realize I am actually going to worship. I'm not going to hear special music or I'm not going to hear a sermon. Or I'm, not going to, I'm going to worship God. I can worship Him through my giving. I can worship Him through my singing. I can worship Him through listening and opening my heart to His Word. But the, the focus turns from, from what I'm going to get out of it to, to, to focusing on God and allowing Him to do in me what he wants to do during this very sacred time. I want us to come to a place as a church that we are living according to the book. We're loving according to the book. We're worshiping according to the book. I want us to get back to being a people of the book. Let's pray. <clears throat>
Father, this morning I want to pray for your Holy Spirit. I'm thankful today that we have a loving God that, that uh, through these stories and scriptures, you, you always want to point us back to you. You want to point us back to true worship, to true love, to understanding evangelism, to, under, to, to everything, to understanding life and family and, and relationships. But today we're, we've been thinking about worship. We've been thinking about truth. And, and so I'm just praying that, Father, as we think uh, specifically about coming here and spending time inside these doors that we will realize that there is a God in heaven if we're rightly worshiping him who is hearing and and acknowledging our prayers and our songs and our givings and our, our offerings and and that Lord you are wanting and willing and waiting to transform each one of us and so we want to invite you to do that we offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving today thank you for Jesus Thank you for all you do for us. Thank you for allowing trials and tribulations to come in our lives, to, to, to point us back to you, to steer us in the direction we need to go. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you do for us. And I pray that every one of us here today will love you as we've never loved you before. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Closing hymn is number five.